Greetings to our viewers and audiences who are watching this episode of the Desk Interview Series. My name is Min Feng, and I am Editor-in-Chief at The Desk, a student financial media outlet. And we welcome our audiences to our interview series where we invite guest speakers who are experts in the field to discuss certain economic and global affairs. Without further ado, we are honored to have award-winning journalist Jane Ferguson joining us for our second episode of the interview series. Jane is the recipient of the 2018 George Polk Award for Foreign Television Reporting and the 2019 Emmy Award for News and Documentary. She was nominated for a Peabody Award in 2018 for her work in Yemen, and she is also a grantee of the Pulitzer Center. With over a decade of experience living in the Middle East and reporting from the Arab world, Africa, and South Asia, Jane's work focuses on conflicts, diplomacy, and humanitarian stories. She started her journalism career in Dubai, working for Gulf News after graduating from York University in 2007. Two years later, in 2009, Jane began reporting for CNN International, covering stories behind rising terrorist groups across underreported hotspots such as Somalia, Yemen, and the African Sahel. During the Arab Spring in 2011, Jane worked as a correspondent for Al Jazeera, covering the Yemen's revolution that toppled the 34-year regime of President Ali Abdullah Saleh. A year later, she covered stories in Syria during the crackdown of protests carried out by the Bashir al-Assad regime. In 2015, with a move to PBS NewsHour, Jane led the network's coverage of the military offensive against ISIS. In 2018, Jane's exclusive coverage of the dangerous No Reporter Zone of Northern Yemen revealed the devastating humanitarian crisis that is now the worst in the world and is also the topic of our talk today. Jane, it is my honor to have you with the desk. Thank you so much for having me. So right now, as we all know, Yemen is in a dire situation. The, the country has been ravaged by civil war, horrific famine, and mass displacements for the past six years. You worked and covered stories on the field, on the front lines in Yemen. Could you give us a brief on the events leading up to today, starting from the Arab Spring in 2011 uh, that brought down uh, President Saleh? Sure. I mean, it's been an incredible sort of eight years for the country now. Uh, protests broke out there as they did all across the Middle East, and 2012 was a real hotspot for that. And as you've said in your introduction, the, the dictator of Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh, had been in power for over three decades. Um, he had, part of how he had maintained power was to sort of keep a certain degree of power equilibrium uh, and a certain consensus amongst the tribes, because Yemen's a very tribal society. And <clears throat> once he was removed, there was a fracturing, as we've seen in so many countries where you just remove a dictator and trying to replace a, a, a decades long system with another, it leaves a very dangerous power vacuum in between. So everything fractured. He eventually agreed to step down, but he remained in Yemen. And that was sort of unlike other dictators, like some, some stepped down like Ben Ali um, and, and, other, and other dictators that had left uh, from their countries during the Arab Spring. But with with Ali Abdullah Saleh, he did step down, so he was able to negotiate some terms. He was able to negotiate some immunity from prosecution and to remain in the country. And he did so, however, the power struggles that resulted when he stepped down led to a lot of chaos in the country. You had the military fracturing, you had a push for, for grabbing power, and he eventually did a deal with a group called the Houthis, which is a a revivalist, uh, it's a revivalist Shia group in the north of Yemen. I mean, it's, it's not the same as the Shias you or I would know from Iran, but it's similar. Um, oh. And they uh, basically helped them come to Sana'a in 2014 and take over the city again. And the Houthis eventually um, pushed all the way south, uh, to the south of the country, almost towards the southern capital of Aden, um, but they, that's what <clears throat> alarmed the Saudi neighbors and Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE. These countries were absolutely alarmed because they see Iran largely as a foe. They saw the Houthis as potential Iranian puppets. So they uh, basically formed a coalition of partners, Arab states, other, other, uh, you know, uh, other 
militaries that give aid and help, like the United States or, or Britain, right. to push back the Houthis. They managed to push them far, like further north, but then they stalled very quickly in that campaign in 2015. What we've seen since then is just a, a quagmire of a war where the Houthis control the northern capital and main parts up there, and the south and all the east of the country is loosely controlled by allies of the coalition. Right, right, right. And a lot of times, the, um, the foreign policy, uh, when you look at and also the, the, the consensus is, there's a lot of comparisons to be drawn between Lebanon's Hezbollah and Yemen's Houthi rebels, because assumingly both agendas are under Shia Islam and both of their purposes are claimed to be a, a sort of resistance against an external threat. So for Hezbollah, that external threat has always been uh, Israel. And for the Houthis, in this case, it would be Saudi Arabia. Uh, but the Houthis don't necessarily receive the same sort of reception from, from the Islamic Republic of Iran as Hezbollah does. And, and both Hezbollah and, and, and Iran have denied any accusations of, of providing material support despite evidences. So what are the Houthis fighting for and how important is Iran in this fight? It's, it is easy to make a comparison of Hezbollah and the Houthis, um, partly because of course they are Iranian allies. That's largely where it ends though. And I do think it's reasonable to assume that there are some relations. You know, the, the Saudis have accused um, the Iranians of sending Hezbollah agents to Yemen to train them, to teach them how to use drones. And given the Houthis' quite recent and growing uh, expertise in things like drone usage, that does seem likely. Now, I lived in Beirut for, for six years up until just now, and I would go to Hezbollah funerals, rallies, their, their, their big public events, and you see Houthi flags and Houthi support everywhere. So there's certainly a relationship. But there's a really, there are really distinct and important differences between the two groups. The Hezbollah are a group that was largely formed by Iran. They are a brainchild and complete Iranian uh, uh, creation. And so they are, their relationship with Iran is total. They're, they're funded by Iran. They were formed by Iran. They are a Lebanese group but you cannot separate Hezbollah from Iran. Right. Whereas the Houthis, there's, they, were, they existed long before there were relationships with Iran. The Houthis is a revivalist uh, group in the north of, of, of Yemen uh, of, of basically a different kind of, uh, they have a relationship with Shiism, but it's a different kind of Shiism. In Iran, you've got Twelverism. And with, with these guys, they have, this is very much so a Yemeni, uh, religious revivalist group that has been operational since the 90s, that, that actually fought wars against the Yemeni government all throughout the, the noughties in 2009. They, they, they fought several wars. So they are different, but it's likely that they have, uh, on, I think what's likely to have happened throughout this war is that what the Saudis have accused the Houthis of being, as in puppets of Iran, may have become something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because the longer the war has gone, gone on, the, the, the tighter those relationships are likely to be, because the more the Houthis are likely to rely on the Iranians for some funding. Right, right, right. And exactly like you say, the Saudi-led coalition, because of nine countries and backed by presumably billions of dollars worth of logistical support from the United States and the United Kingdom, but, but the coalition is still fighting these marginalized northern militants. And why, why are the Houthis in Yemen costing the coalition so much? And why is this, this, this war being dragged on for so long? It's, it is a really interesting uh, question. It's really important because we bring into this question the, uh, a, a universal issue to do with wars. I mean, why has the might of the U.S. military not been able to stamp out a bunch of of, of, uh, uh, of Taliban fighters who basically live in the mountains and carry mostly just AK-47s. Right. This is, a, this is a, a, the, the, the existential war issue of uh, insurgencies. Insurgencies are very, very difficult to stamp out. They fight on their own territory. They, you know, they don't need to, to meet you on the battlefield. 
You don't have Saudi soldiers coming in in waves and, and complex military um, complex military formations. You have airstrikes trying to take out an embedded, locally relatively supported uh, insurgent group. That is a challenge for any military, the most experienced. You know, in military circles, they often say that with an aerial bombing campaign to try to take out a rebel group, if it doesn't work within the first few months, it's not going to. It's like trying to, it's like trying to get rid of ants with a hammer. Right. So these are military strategies that make it very, very difficult. The Houthis are totally embedded uh, in these areas, and you cannot, you cannot rout out an insurgency with airstrikes alone. And unless you're willing to put massive amounts of troops on the ground and get stuck in a ground war and take major casualties, then you know, this is what we see. We see these sorts of quagmires where you literally just run out of things to keep bombing. Right, right, right. And exactly like you said, and also the consensus, is this, this civil war and pretty much generally an insurgency, when you're in it, there, there is no end in sight. And in this example, in Yemen, the coalition is not backing down. U.S. Congress tried to pass a resolution to withdraw logistical support from Yemen, but White House vetoed it in 2018, late 2018. Uh, the Houthis are not upholding U.N. broker truces. And Yemeni men, women, and children are, are dying from airstrikes, the famine, and they're caught in the crossfire. So what can we expect from this multifaceted uh, deadlock moving forward? Unfortunately, the longer the debt, as, as is often the case with these sorts of situations, the longer the deadlock, deadlock lasts, the worse it becomes. It becomes more complex putting a country back together again because the country has fractured. So you, whilst you've had the coalition all but, it, all but acknowledging publicly that this is not working, that this has been disastrously unsuccessful, they have tried to sort of somewhat retreat, certainly their own ground troops and their own people out of the country. The danger has been amongst the coalition side that they have armed and equipped and made a lot of promises to oh, their own proxy armed groups. Some of those armed groups are uh, you know, tribes that have had relationships with Al Qaeda in the past. Some of those armed groups are separatists who do not support the unity of the, of the country at all. They want their own separate South. This is going to be the difficult issue. These groups are already fighting each other in the South. Instead of fighting the Houthis, they're fighting one another. So you're seeing that cannibalization and that fracturing. So going forward, getting those groups united is going to be incredibly important. On the other side, what we're seeing with the Houthis is some increasingly ugly behavior, increasingly repressive behavior, you know, jailing journalists, torture, child soldiers, but also pressuring the international aid community to let them uh, be in charge of distributing aid. Uh, they want to tax aid. They are exacerbating the humanitarian crisis. They are also becoming increasingly hardline, increasingly paranoid, increasingly difficult to deal with in terms of trying to find a solution to, um, to, to like a, a basically come, come to the table. So from the Houthis perspective, they feel like they're winning this war. And to a certain extent they are because they're simply their survival is a, a victory for them. But so the, the challenges going forward will be trying to get all of these groups to sit down and negotiate a settled peace that they're, you know, to, to, to negotiate in, in, in earnest. And right now, all of the groups are too busy fighting for their own interests. And there isn't a centralized push for a stable country going forward. And that is something that's very, very difficult to put back together. Once you've broken a certain social uh, contract in a country, this idea that a country should exist, that there should be a centralized government, that there should be, you know, uh, that there should be a, a certain uh, political structure that holds the country together, it can be very difficult to put that back together again. Look at Somalia in the 1990s. So this is going to be the difficulty, is getting people united around the idea of a Yemeni state and then getting them to agree on how to move forward with that. And again, without meaning to make this answer too long, one of the most frustrating things that journalists like I uh, have seen, and many of my colleagues over the last 10 years, especially with the post uh, 
Arab Spring wars that have broken out is outside influence does not shorten wars, it lengthens them. The more right. you have Iranians involved, Saudis involved, Emiratis involved, Americans, this lengthens wars. It fuels them, it literally arms them, it, it, it gives armed insurgent groups a, a, a more, it, it takes pressure away to come to the negotiating table because they have more supplies, they have more uh, allies, they, ha they feel like they have more to fight for. And so wars are getting longer. So in Yemen, we need the international backers to really earnestly want peace um, and to, 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 to push for that. Right, right, right. But hasn't, hasn't the, the United Nations, the EU, also America tried that in January 2014, they hosted the National Dialogue Conference, the NDC, and tried to broker a deal between the Houthis and the Hadi's uh, governments breaking up Yemen into six federal states and splitting parliaments into 50-50 between Sunnis and, and the Zaid uh, Houthi um, tribe. Uh, but that hasn't worked. It's interesting to see how sort of, even though with, with uh, the, the external forces, but also the parties that are playing in, in Yemen in 2014, they came to the table, they talked, but then the, the, the Yemen was so it's close to a democracy, but now, we, <laughs> six years later, no progress at all. Yes, it is really sad. There have, been, there have been a number of missed opportunities just like that. And since 2014, there's so much more bad blood now because so many things have happened. Um, you're right that there are ongoing attempts to bring peace by the international community. The United Nations has been trying. They've been fighting very hard brokering between both sides. But the reality of today, the reality of today's world is that the, you know, no matter how much the United Nations wants peace, it really comes down to the much more powerful nations that are enabling the war to take place, such as the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. So uh, very often the real push for peace is by groups like the United Nations that simply don't have the same kind of power. They can't, the United Nations cannot force the end of a war. They can simply try to, 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 to get all sides to sit down together. But at the end of the day, in any war, it, it, you know, it, it's the parties to the conflict who have to honestly and earnestly want an end to a war. Right, right. And uh, I want to break free from foreign policy and move into the sort of journalism work that you've done um, in Yemen on the field. So whilst uh, covering stories in Yemen in 2018, um, you were smuggled into the Northern Territory where the Houthi rebels are based. And so it's a no reporter zone, very hostile militiamen all around you. And all you had was pretty much a passion to shed lights on the lives of the absolute losers of any war, and especially for the, this war, the civilians who are suffering from, from terrible, terrible famine. So tell us more about that story. So why and how did you manage to pull off this dangerous venture for essentially a story? Well. You know, I've been covering Yemen for a very long time. I've had a long relationship with this country. I went there after college whenever I graduated in the middle of uh, the economic crisis of 2007. So, um, so it was hard to find work. So I went there initially to study Arabic. You know, it was a story that I was very close to, very passionate about. Um, but a lot of journalists as well had tried desperately to get in and to get up to Houthi controlled areas. But it was, it was really, really difficult. It was clear the only way to do it would be to try to smuggle yourself. Um, and so there were many other journalists that were just sort of waiting, hoping that their uh, news organizations would allow them. I mean, at the end of the day, us journalists are often controlled, or not controlled, but we're often like answerable to organizations that really want to keep us safe. Right. And that's difficult whenever, you know, your work is not always safe. So... There were a lot of us, I remember the New York Times, the BBC, uh, Washington Post, CNN, everybody wanted to like try to do this. And so it was just kind of a case of someone stepping forward and volunteering to try it. I 
had the fortunate, I, I, you know, I am a freelance journalist. I'm self-employed. You know, I, I, right. I mostly work with PBS and The New Yorker, but I do get to make a lot more decisions myself. So it did, I was definitely kind of in a better position to make that decision. I had very good contacts, very, a very, very good fixer. And I was willing to go alone. That's kind of what really what you needed to do. That's a large part of my work generally now. You know, like I was in November, I was working in Afghanistan and spending time with the Taliban and in, in areas they control. You wow. know, these sorts of these sorts of, of of stories are very often told best with a group of local uh, uh, colleagues and yourself. So I'll go in and I'll assemble a team of people and then I'll work with them rather than bringing in like five really obvious really easy to spot Westerners. So, um, right, so I, right. to, yeah, so, so I was able to travel with some, some Yemeni uh, contacts and I just was able to dress as a Yemeni woman and, and hide my identity to get yeah. through. So, you know, for me, it was worth it. There's plenty of very, very dangerous risks that we could take as journalists. And, and I hate to decide what story is more important than another, but the truth is you have to, question what kind of an impact your reporting would have, how uh, uncovered a story is. And I was just getting very tired of reading about statistics rather than stories. You have to go in and meet people and talk to them and tell their stories. And the ugly reality, unfortunately, of journalism is unless your correspondent is there in the hospitals, you know, in the, 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 the areas that are being bombed, it just doesn't get the same coverage. You have to go there. So, um, and it also, if we're talking about war crimes, potential war crimes and accusations of war crimes, you know, you can't do that unless you're there gathering evidence and actually letting people know what is happening. Right. So I for me, it's worth it. Of course, of course. And while you were there, you witnessed horrific, horrific humanitarian crisis that is going on still to this day. And UNICEF, Médecins Sans Frontières, Save the Children, they have extensive aid programs, but all of them have said that delivering that aid to desperate Yemenis, it's a whole different challenge, a whole different story. Um, could you provide us more details on why it's so difficult to deliver aid to the people needed? Sure. Coming from a person who has been on the field? It's, Yemen is, Every aid worker, every like manager who was trying to run an aid program said the same thing to me, that what was so challenging about Yemen, as opposed to places like South Sudan or Nigeria or other places where we've had recent um, hunger crises or Somalia, was the vast, vast quantity of people. Like nowhere else on earth do two thirds of the population, in fact, I think now it's closer to three quarters, need food aid. Like we're talking tens of millions of people. It has never been, you know, most aid agencies have never had to deal with that kind of widespread hunger. Um, and so we're literally talking a matter of scale and that is billions of dollars worth of food that is necessary. And they don't global pandemic that's causing a global uh, economic downturn. So they don't always get the, the, the finances that they need. And one of the other challenges is the airstrikes. You know, I was in a hospital in very, very rural Northern area, and I bumped into one MSF uh, uh, coordinator. She was Australian and she was the only foreigner I had seen since I left Sanaa. Right. And she was only there to shut down their operation for a few days because airstrikes had hit an MSF clinic and destroyed it. Luckily, no one was there because it was due to be opened in the next couple of days. So aid agencies have to try to keep their people safe. So it's very difficult to operate under airstrikes because it's very tough to guarantee that you're not gonna get hit. Hospitals have been hit. So that impacts their ability to do their work. The other thing, of course, is that the Houthis intimidate aid agencies all the time. They have right. to give, they have to give permission for you to drive through checkpoints. They have to give permission. They, they think foreigners are spies. They're utterly paranoid. 
So, and they try to shake down the aid agencies for money. So it's, it's an incredibly difficult place for them to operate. Right, right, right. And talking about the, 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 the massive scale of the famine, um, there have been accusations of the naval blockade led by the, the, the Saudi coalition that the famine is actually man-made and the, the coalition is y using hunger uh, and using the famine as a, a tool to win this war. Um, is, this, is this something that you, you saw or something that you think is, 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 is true? I think it's not true that they're using hunger to win the war because actually the hunger has been a big problem for the coalition. The hunger has been something that has put massive political pressure on the Saudis. These images on the front page of the New York Times of a dying little little girl, um, you know, uh, you know, on on your TV screens on PBS, this places a huge amount of pressure on them. So they're not trying to impose the hunger, but they have deliberately used economic warfare, part of which the hunger is a side effect. So yes, they have they have purposefully um, implemented economic warfare as part of a strategy here, whether it was the blockade or whether it was, you know, doing things like moving the central bank to the south of the country. They moved it out of the capital, which meant that the civil servants, who by far are the largest, you know, the, the, the biggest employer is the state. So everything from a school teacher to a doctor to uh, someone who works in offices uh, before this war, before the Arab Spring, worked for the state. Um, by moving the central bank, that meant many, many people who were living in uh, Houthi-controlled areas uh, stopped getting a salary because they weren't allowed, to, they weren't able to withdraw a salary unless they were physically in the South. So there have been uh, attempts to economically squeeze the area that the Houthis control, but that yeah. means economically squeezing millions and millions of people, many of whom simply could not afford to buy food couldn't afford like the food prices had gone up already suddenly they're out of work so whenever you pr place a blockade or implement a military strategy that purposefully collapses an economy hunger is a side effect images of starving babies very very bad for the coalition that's something that puts massive pressure on them so they're not trying to starve people they're trying to place pressure on the houthis um from the local population. They want the Houthis to run out of money. They want the local population to potentially rise up against them. They want them to blame the Houthis. But unfortunately, all that that has done is create a humanitarian crisis. In turn, the Houthis have exacerbated the humanitarian crisis by making it very difficult for the aid agencies to alleviate it. Right, I see, I see. And being a work on the field, um, would you like to share with us a couple of mon moments that um, for you was very memorable when you were working in Yemen? Well, there's so many memories. Like Yemen is, is such a special place because it is the tribal culture and the, the, just the Yemeni culture has very much so maintained this incredible sense of uh, very traditional values of hospitality. So, I mean, I just, for me, it was remarkable that people who have nothing, who are literally hungry, would, would treat me with so much respect. I remember being in the old, in the, the main souk in the old city in Sana'a, which is spectacular. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's one of the oldest cities in the world. Right. And it, it was Ramadan, so people fast. It was the holy month, so they fast for much, much of the day. And then when the sun sets, they eat. And so people, typically you break your fast with, with uh, dates um, and people would come up to me, a complete stranger uh, in the street and they would give me dates because I'm, they see that I'm a guest in their, in their country and that is hugely important to them. Um, so, you know, I mean, I just, it's, it's people that have been ravaged by war, um, a war that, you know, I mean, a lot of the bombs that are falling on them are literally British and American. And the fact that they would just come up to me and, treat me as an honored guest and give me dates and tell me you're so welcome in our country was just, you know, it was so humbling for me. Um, and not surprising because I've been to Yemen many times and, and it really is that lovely, but it really, really was, you know, this is the, the kind of contradictory 
parallel universe that a lot of us war reporters find ourselves in, where we're in a place where the most unspeakable things are happening between humans. They are doing terrible things to one another. And yet they're also capable of these incredible acts of generosity and kindness and hospitality. So, you know, th this, this kind of human spirit exists in, in, any, in any war I've been in, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan, but in Yemen, it's, it's really quite an embedded part of their culture. And it, I'm grateful to learn that the war is not killing that off. Right. I see. I see. And obviously, Yemen has a special place in your heart. Um, do you see yourself coming back to Yemen uh, to produce another documentary? Seeing that you just moved from Beirut, Lebanon, to New York this past month, am I assuming yeah. correctly that um, you are putting a, a big pause on your Yemen coverage and moving on to new stories? Or is this simply to evade the current uh, uh, tumultuous uh, Lebanese crisis? So uh, no, unfortunately, this trip this move to New York was planned like six months ago. And, and I feel terrible for leaving the Lebanese crisis because I should be there covering it. But right. um, I, uh, no, I, I don't have any plans to reduce my coverage of Yemen. Unfortunately, none of us can get visas. Ah. The, yeah, so basically, I actually was just speaking with contacts and contacted the embassy here uh, just last week for, about a year and a half now I've been trying to get back in, as have every news organization on the planet. The visas are granted officially and technically by the Yemeni government, which is the, the government that's recognized internationally that is in exile in Saudi Arabia. And that is essentially uh, answerable to the Saudis. And so the Saudis and the coalition, which is mostly Saudis and UAE, uh, vet who gets visas and they vet who's allowed on airplanes and journalists do not get visas. So there's a very successful concerted attempt to censor the story continually, even though, you know, many of us got in, in 2018, 19. So now we've gone back to a situation where we're all denied access once more. Um, and so that's why I haven't covered it. But if I could get a visa today, I would be there tonight. So. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> And so, big question to, to sum up this very, very, very uh, interesting episode for our interview series is, what's next for Jane Ferguson? <laughs> well, what's next is Princeton University. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I've actually, I've been asked, I've been invited to teach for the fall term, just as a guest professor. Um, this is something that had been in the works for, for, for quite a while. So way pre-COVID world. Um, so I was meant to spend sort of September through December pre physically present here and, and in Princeton teaching a course on war reporting, but it's mostly on like the historical narrative and looking at wars throughout history from the Spanish Civil War and basically coverage of these by, by the media, Vietnam, uh, post 9-11 wars. So uh, unfortunately that's gonna have to be probably mostly via Zoom now. Um, right. So I'm still gonna be teaching but it is mostly gonna be tried via Zoom. Now I technically start the last day of August. So I'm trying to see if I can possibly fit in one more work trip between now and then. But with coronavirus, it's very complex. Um, so we shall see. Um, after that, 2021, is, is anybody's guess? I feel like the whole world is having a reset. So uh, for me, you know, I'd, I'd like to, uh, there's a million different stories I'd like to do, different things I'd like to do, but it's very difficult to pin anything down right now. Life is just spinning plates. So we'll see where all the chips land whenever Corona hopefully is behind us. I see, I see. And um, so thank you so much for your time and also for such, such a, a comprehensive um, story. And I just want to say that in a tumultuous world of foreign policy and, and sectarian conflicts, uh, it is the innocent civilians who will come out as the definite losers of war. But, and usually the stories are unfortunately shadowed by other major who news headlines. But as a war journalist, you put your life on the line in order to bring light to the forgotten and abandoned people of Yemen. And then your team at PBS and your employees before you and, and yourself 
you risk, you risk your lives to, to give Yemenis a voice and um, so that the world could listen. Your work is a tremendous inspiration to the desk and to me personally as well. And there's a lot more that we could do to let the world know about Yemen. And I'm greatly honored that the desk is part of your mission. So thank you, Jane, for all you have done and for joining us today. And we look forward to your future endeavors. Well, thank you so much. That's incredibly kind of you to say. And stay in touch. Thank you so much, Jane. All right.